and uh, want to read a, a few verses here. First Corinthians chapter twelve, and speaking along, thinking along the lines of things that are easy to take for granted. Uh, if you've been saved for any amount of time, um, what you what you learn really fast is that it's easy to forget where you came from. It's easy to forget what, what God saved you from or what your life could have turned out like. I mean, if the Lord really did sort of reel back everything and let you experience a, this is, you know, a, it's a wonderful life type of experience and you could see how your life could have turned out if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, uh, that would uh, maybe change dynamically the way that you look at life. Um, we take a lot for granted. That's my point. And it's very easy to take... I think this for granted. Uh, there are Christians right now in India. There are Christians right now in China. There are Christians right now in the Middle East. There are Christians right now in Africa uh, and other places in the world that I haven't mentioned who are not able to openly come together on a Wednesday night with the lights on and open up Bibles and sing some songs about their Savior and get together and praise God and learn something from His book. Um, really easy to take that for granted as an American. But even further than that, even the liberties you have as an American, the things that you have in Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about what you find in the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12. We'll start reading here. For as the body is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? You may not think the, 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 the sense of uh, smell is a big deal. You ever been sick and then you can't breathe out of your nose? You ever notice how weird your food tastes? Again, it's one of those things you don't think about until you can't do it, right? That's how it is in the body of Christ. Uh, look, if you would, at verse number 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. I want to call your attention to verse 18, and I want you to understand that church, contrary to popular opinion, church is not solely here for our pleasure. Man, there's a lot of benefits we're going to talk about, a lot of things we get out of it, but church... And your Christian life and your entire existence should not be here simply for your pleasure. We have an entire generation. I was listening uh, to, to the radio today and listening on this, a certain subject matter. You've got parents that are chronicling their kid's life overly and abundantly online. Look, I'm not saying you can't have Facebook, you can't have Instagram, but you have, you have parents that have nine-year-olds that have blogs now. You've got, all, that nine-year-old has their own YouTube channel. Go outside and, and ride a bike, you know. Go outside and do something, you know, real. Instead of living in this virtual world, what am I getting at? Well, what I'm getting at is simply this. Everything in our society points to the idea that everything is here for us and for our pleasure. And the problem is that mentality has spilled into the church. So what happens when people come to church, the first thing they think of is, what do I get out of this? What programs are there for me? What are here for my kids? What's, what can I get? Now look, God has a lot of things here for you. But I can tell you right now, you ought to be here tonight not to please yourself or even to please the preacher. You ought to be here tonight to please God. I mean, after all, the Bible says all things were made by Him. All things were created for what reason? For His pleasure. Look at verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Now are they many members, yet but one body. Let's go, Lord, tonight in prayer. Father, thank you for this chance to open up the book. 
Lord, would you teach us something? Lord, would you help us not to take your body for granted? Lord, we're not talking about a ritual, or we're not talking about uh, just a vain religion or just some kind of thing that we do because it's what we're supposed to do, Lord, but, but truly what the passage is referring to as the body of Christ, Lord, help us not to take it for granted. Lord, help us to realize all that we find in you and all that we find, Lord, as being part of the body of Christ. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to I wanna start off by saying this. I've got to set the foundation for this because I think that there's a lot of confusion uh, even in a lot of independent Baptist churches about what, what the body of Christ actually is. I don't want to make this entire message about this doctrinal uh, position, but I need you to understand this. Yes, Paul is writing to the local church uh, of, of the Corinthians, the Corinthian Christians. He's writing the church of Corinth. We can all agree on that. All right? That said, what Paul is writing about is something that does not, is not limited to that one local body there in Corinth. He does take things that, are, that apply to this spiritual body, and he does apply them to a local church. But there are things you need to understand, and I, I got some of you, I may burst your bubble by saying this, and you may not like it. But guess what? If somebody's non-denominational, and they got saved by putting their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, guess what? They're in the body. Amen. Sorry. All right? You say, how do you know that? I can't, that's Baptist heresy. Here's why. The Bible says you are baptized into that body by one spirit. Can I ask you a question? Did you get baptized through the spirit of God when you got saved or when you got in water? When you got saved. <laughs> Otherwise, what you end up making is, is baptismal regeneration. In other words, you're getting saved by getting baptized. That is not biblical, guys. We understand that what Paul is writing about here is something that, it, that is, a, as he calls in Ephesians chapter 5, a mystery. It's a mystery. All right? Now, now that said, that said, he is writing to a local church about this thing. And the things that apply to the body at large apply to local churches as well. What are some things that you find in the body of Christ? I need you to understand this as well. Uh, again, contrary to what some folks might think, the Jews in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, they are God's chosen people, even to this day. Romans chapter 11 says, blindness in part has happened to the nation of Israel. That's called the mystery. Uh, that's also called a mystery. Romans chapter number 11. You can read about that towards uh, the, the, uh, the 20s and 30s in those verses there. And Paul addresses the fact that, look, uh, God is not done with the nation of Israel, but you need to get this. The nation of Israel, while God calls them a congregation, while He calls them an assembly, and in Hebrews, He talks about them being a church in the Old Testament wilderness. All right? While He talks about that, you need to understand, the nation of Israel is not the body of Christ. You also need to understand this, the body of Christ is not made up of any physical nation. Look around this room. Amen? Have you ever noticed how diverse Aurora is? Yeah. I mean, you've got folks that are, you know, country folks that, that just stayed in Aurora. You guys understand, Aurora used to be all plains. Used to be country. I know it's hard for you to understand. You've got country folks. You've got folks from Asia. You've got folks from Europe. You've got folks from all over the world. Look, look around here, man. The body of Christ is not limited to one nation. It was in the Old Testament. As far as God dealing with one nation, it was limited to one nation in the Old Testament. God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. But, man, this whole the thing we're a part of is unique. You know what you find in the body of Christ? You find novelty. Consider this. For four, guys, if, if you believe the Bible, and this, I mean, if you have a problem with this, you can study it out for yourself. If you believe the Bible, man has been on the earth for 6,000 years. You know, some of you might be thinking, you're right now. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, when someone tells me that an explosion happened and everything showed up out of nowhere, I'll say, okay, you know what? An explosion happened at a nut and bolt factory, and poof, out pops a Toyota Prius. <laughs> right? If you believe the Bible, man has been around for 6,000 years on this earth. For 4,000 of those 6,000 years, you understand, there was no such thing as the body of Christ. It wasn't here. You are a part of something that's very unique. You find novelty in the body of Christ. Think, I want you to think about the fact that God makes things new. Now, I understand, if you know the, the, the book of Acts, you understand that there is a danger. There's a danger that comes with always looking for a new thing. 
All right, Paul addresses the Athenians there at Mars Hill, and he debates with them, and he realizes they're superstitious in the book of Acts, and they're always looking. All that they do all day long is they sit around, and they, they're looking for some new thing to talk about. Guys, can I tell you this? Um, all, uh, the, the idea that man has somehow in the last 10 years become so data hungry, that appetite's always been there. Just now you have the ability to fulfill it within seconds. And just flip through and see some on YouTube and flip over here and see some on this social media site and flip over here and watch it on, on this channel and so on and so forth. But it's always been a man likes talking about new things, right? I mean, the old things get boring after a while. That's what happens in that. There's a danger in that. But I'll also say this. God takes something and, and that nobody thinks can, he can do anything with and he makes it new. I mean, can you think about this? God, think about the first time it rained, what man thought. Can you imagine the first day of creation? Can, can you imagine the first sunrise, the first sunset, the first rainbow, the first man, <laughs> the first lightning bolt? I mean, that must have creeped people out. God did that. He makes things new. How about you? <laughs> if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You know what he did with you? He took something that was, the Bible says, ye who were dead in your, in your trespasses and sins. Spiritually speaking, before somebody is saved, their spirit is dead. That's why Jesus Christ said, ye must be born again. And I've got news for you. If you believe in new age, that is not, God is not talking about being reincarnated over and over and over. He's talking about the fact that your spirit is dead. Something is missing. That thing that's missing is a fellowship with the, creation, the creator of this universe. And you can only have it through Jesus Christ. But you know what he did with you? He took a dead spirit and he gave it life. You say, what is that? You're a new creature. You know what God did? Now think about this. I want, I want you to consider this. The novelty that you find in the body of Christ. Think about for, uh, when, when, when the Lord is sitting down, and let's say the Lord had a committee. And I know he didn't. He doesn't need a committee, all right? The Lord doesn't need a vote to approve what he does. All right? That said, let's say he pulled a community together of people uh, in that first century. Maybe he gets the disciples together and he goes, okay, guys, let's take a poll. Uh, what do you think we should do as far as getting the gospel out? Well, Lord, I... Uh, I think the angels did a pretty good job there in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, they were faithful to take the message. Why don't we just stick with that? Nah, I don't think so. Well, Lord, I mean, if you look at the track record for the last couple thousand years, you've got one nation that's dealing with truth, and they've kept it. They have preserved it. All the truth that you gave from Genesis to Malachi, they've got it. They've been taking care of it. Let's just stick with that. And the Lord goes, yeah, but they rejected me as their king, and so, no. You know what he does? He does something that no one saw coming. <laughs> he creates something called the body of Christ. And he says, I want to make something new. And, and, and regardless of what man thinks about it, God takes something and he goes, you know what? There's nothing here, but I'll make something great out of it. Right. Look at Isaiah chapter 43. Go there if you would. Isaiah chapter 43. You know what happens sometimes on a Wednesday night? You know what happens sometimes on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning? And let's, let's, all, let's all just be honest about it. There are times where our flesh convinces us, you know, what's the point in going to church? What's the point in being a part of this thing? What's the point in any of it? The point is that to God, it is a great thing. It is a mysterious thing that God himself created. And it ought to be a blessing to you. And when you're tempted to think, man, what is the big deal? Remind yourself that God did this thing. He's the one that puts the members in the body as is pleased him. Look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, now I understand that this in large part talks about after the tribulation and, and uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to set up his kingdom. But I want, I want you to spiritually look at this and apply it spiritually. Look at verse 18. Remember ye not the former things, nor consider, neither consider the things of old. You know what God did when he made the church? He said, I'm going to do something different. <laughs> I'm going to do something unique. I mean, let's be honest tonight. If God wanted to be really, really what we would consider efficiency. Now, I, 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 uh, uh, before I did the job that I have now, I dealt a lot with lean manufacturing. It's all about reducing waste, making processes in manufacturing. I'm already boring some of you to death right now. Making some of those processes more efficient. If, if we were to look at how God did, we go, oh, God, you could have done this a whole lot better way. And God says, no, this is exactly how I want to do it. I want to use fallen man to carry my message on. 
and I'm going to use a bunch of sinners who don't always get along, who come from different backgrounds, and I'm going to stick them all together. I'm going to say, get along and do something in my name. That's the body of Christ. Look, if you would, at, at verse number 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You say, what does God do? He takes where there's nothing but death and destruction, and he makes life out of it. He makes a new creature out of the old. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. You know what you find there? You find novelty. You find something that's very, very, very unique. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know what people talk about? Man, you got to check out this new app. You got to check out this new game. You got to check out. I, I have to admit, guys, I, I'm not kicking you for it. I'm not saying it's sin or it's bad. But I get a kick out of a bunch of grown men getting their phones out and going, look at this game. <laughs> it's, it's funny to me. I'm not making fun of you, okay? All right? And I'm putting his head down. All right? It's funny. But you know what people do? They walk around. Oh, look at this new thing. Look at this new thing. Oh, you got to check out this new movie. You got to see this new show. Man, you know what you ought to be excited about? This new thing that God does called the church. And you know why it's constantly new? Because he's constantly adding new members to that body. He's constantly bringing sinners who are on their way to hell and grafting them in. He's bringing uh, Christians who've been backslidden for years. Guys, I prayed for 10 years for my sister Melissa to get right with God. And let me, let me just be very honest with you. There have been days, there have been days when as a man in my flesh I think, Lord, what am I doing here? God, what do you have me doing in Aurora, Colorado? And there are days when the Lord says, hey, shut up and look what I can do. I can take someone who's so far from me and I can draw them back and place them in a place where the Bible is being preached. Aren't you glad you're here? Yeah. Yes, Lord, I am. Yeah. It's new. You know what else you see there? Look, if you would at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to point out to you, look if you would at verse number 11. But all these work at that one and the selfsame spirit. Verse 12. For as the body is one, later on in that verse, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for one, by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Verse number uh, 13, to drink into one spirit. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. I could go on and on and on. That word one shows up 12 times in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You say, what's the point? What's the emphasis? Unity. You know what you find in the body of Christ? Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, well, pastor, I mean, church is split. They have problems. Uh, this person, no, look, guys, this is hilarious. To me, this is funny. It's sort of sad at the same time. I have heard of churches splitting because, and this is a true story. I'm not making this up. Because at, at dinner on the grounds one time, this lady said, we should cut the pie this way. And this lady said, no, we should cut it this way. And the church split over how a pie is cut. That's sad. And at the same time, sort of funny. Sort of just one of those really awkward things, you know. Uh, I know you're thinking, you're probably thinking, well, I've seen some bad things in church. How many of you could, let's, be, let's, let's lay it all out there tonight. How many of you could say, I've seen some bad things in churches before? I've seen some people get hurt. I've seen people get stabbed in the back. I've seen this. I, and you know what? I'll tell you right now, those things are real. I don't make light of them. They've really happened. And it's sad. That said, can I also say this? I've seen it happen at work. Right. Last I checked, you haven't quit going to work because of it. Oh, I quit that place. Are you still working, though? Still working a job? People will tell me. I, I look, i tell you what right now. I have had some crummy service at restaurants before. And while I may not go back to that restaurant, I didn't quit eating out. What am I getting at? Every one of those things that we could look at and say, man, that's tough, that's bad, it's a bad break, hated to see that happen, it was really tragic. It happens in every phase of life. You know why? Because you're dealing with fallen creatures. But I can tell you this right now. You cannot get the entire world together. They're trying and it's not working. They're trying to do it based on the idea of peace and it falls apart. Guys, if you know anything about history, they formed the League of Nations and they said this is going to be the World War I, the war to end all wars. That didn't happen. Then they go, okay, uh, well, we need to make the United Nations. And they did that, and guess what? Still no peace. You know what? You, when you come together on a Wednesday night, you come together on a Sunday morning, you know what you're doing? You are saying, regardless of all my issues, regardless of all your issues, 
regardless of all the things that we may not agree on, we can agree on the truths that are found in this book, and we can agree on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have a doctrine that we have in common because of this thing right here. You know what you have there? You've got unity. You show me. Guys, 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 think about this. There are over 500 hymns in this book. You know how the world looks at this? There's over 500 hymns in this book about a dead Jewish carpenter. That's how the world sees it. You know what he is to you? He's a risen Savior. And he's why you're here tonight. You show me any other place where a bunch of people from all kinds of backgrounds get together to sing about a dead guy. Right? That's how the world looks at it. This is different, man. This is unique. You say, what is it? It's unity. It's unity because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what you have? You have one Lord. One faith, one baptism. You know, there's that song, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, right? One in charity, onward Christian. I don't know, some of you, sometimes you've seen that song and you think, well, sometimes we're divided. And it's sad when that's the case. You know, you got to find here that you don't... You ought to be able to find here more than anywhere else unity and a sense of peace and cohesion. Can I say this? Don't let petty... I'm just going to say it like it is. Petty, stupid, silly things separate you from your brothers and sisters in Christ. I've heard of people splitting fellowship because somebody put something on Facebook politically that this other person doesn't agree with. And have some grace with people. Right. Have some charity. You know, we're not going to agree on everything. Now, when someone veers from this book and you have to separate from them, that's fine. But, I mean, come on. There are some things. Well, you know what? I put a picture on there, and she liked everybody else's picture but mine. And I only had five likes because she stole the attention. Come on, now, you may think, now you're thinking I'm being silly. That's how people are. And Christians split over stuff like that. Don't let that happen. Guys, do you, do you really believe that there's a place called hell? Do you believe people go there? Some of you may, some of you may not. That's fine, free country. But if you believe that book, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I believe God, I believe the Bible, but no, people don't go there. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It's one or the other. And if you believe that book and you really believe people are on their way to hell, and you really believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon, and you really believe that someday you're going to stand before him and give account of your life, how you live as a Christian, the things done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be evil, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you know what you have to come to grips with? There's a lot of things that really just don't matter that we get up, uh, all up in arms about. There ought to be unity here. That's what you ought to find in the body of Christ. I, I heard an illustration. You can get 100 pianos in a room, and literally you can get them all tuned to the same tune. Now, you know what's interesting about that? You might be tempted to think, oh, yeah, you do that by getting this piano to follow this piano, and this piano gets in tune with it. No, that's not how it works. They are all basically bowing the knee, if you will, to the tuner itself. That tuner is what sets everything in unison. That tuner for the body of Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's, what said, he's, the, say, he's the one that says, I'm the standard. You're not the standard. I'm not the standard. He is. Right. Unity. Let me say this. You find identity in the body of Christ. You also may find someone that needs to get us making. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Go back there if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to say this. You also find... Your identity in Jesus Christ. You find identity in the body of Christ. You know, uh, sometimes we uh, tend to think that... <laughs> Is that an amen? <laughs> sometimes you tend to think that... Uh, people... I, I'll put you this way. It's easy for a preacher to think, oh, people come to church to listen to me preach. Now... Should you come to church for the preaching of the word of God? Yes, that's true. But I'll tell you something that I believe, whether you realize it, whether you've recognized it or not yet, part of what draws people to come back 
and a fellowship with other believers is they find an identity there. They find, you know what, this completes who I am. And I'm not trying to be, you know, cheesy, oh, you complete me. I'm, I'm being honest, though, really. There's a part of you that's missing when you're not fellowshipping with other like-minded people. And when you find that thing, you go, you know what, this is that thing that's missing. This is part of my identity that I didn't know I needed. Or I, I knew something was missing, and that it is. Now, listen, I understand before you get saved, there's a part of you that's, that's dead, spiritually dead, and that's revived when you couldn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. But you take someone that's saved, and you take them out of church. Can I say this? You take me out of, of the fellowship of God's people for one month. Say, Adrian Dominguez, uh, you don't get to read your Bible, and you don't get to go to church for one month. You will find a very, very different Adrian Dominguez. So why? Because part of my identity, part of who I am, is found in Christ with his people. Let's take a trip to the Bible, Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8, talking about your identity. I, I've, I've, I've told you before, it'd be a great Bible study for you to do in your own time, all the phrases, all the times where you find the phrase, in Christ. Romans chapter number 8, look at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It says there, now no condemnation to them which are where? In Christ. In Christ. And I know it goes on to talk about walking in the Spirit instead of walking in the flesh, but guess what? You can't even get that far if you're not in Christ. <laughs> look, if you would, at, at chapter number 8, look at verse 39. You know what you find in Christ? You find the love of God. You find the love of God in Jesus Christ. Your identity as a Christian, your ability to do what the Bible says you ought to do, by this shall all men know that you love, uh, that you are my disciples, in that you love one another. You can't do that right. Unless you're found in Christ. It's why the world is trying to get together. And they, there's a sense of unity, but it's false. And it always falls apart. You know why ours can stick? Because it's founded on the love of God in Christ. Look at chapter 8 and verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know why a lost man dies and goes to hell forever? You know why people say, well, how could a loving God do that? The problem is this. He is not found in the love of God until he accepts Jesus Christ as a Savior. He might experience the mercy of God. He might experience, uh, uh, if you will, God giving him life and allowing things good in his life. The mercy of God, if you will. But the love of God is found in a man named Jesus Christ. And your identity, the ability to know, the, the, the confidence to say, God loves me, me being a mess and all that I am. You can say that because you are found in Christ. Amen. That's your identity. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We quoted it earlier tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You know what I like about that? As far as God is concerned, you're still and I'm still a creature. Amen? <laughs> you say, why? Uh, I, I think it's a good reminder that we're still not exactly whole. Amen? That doesn't happen until the rapture. But man, at least now you're a new creature. Why? Because of Him. Because you're in Christ. Look at Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 and verse number 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You know what you are tonight? You are a son of God. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good title to have. You are adopted tonight. Your identity is no longer, as a Christian, it no longer should be found in what identified you as a sinner prior to Christ. You understand that? You understand that you are no longer, to, your, your character should not be set by the former life. You should understand that in Christ, you are a child of God. You're a son of God. Man, you are justified. You're redeemed. You're sanctified. Why? Because he adopted you in his family. You know, part of, part of what you carry with you, your last name, that identifies you to a family. And if we know anything about our own families, you know what's funny? Everybody always says the same thing. Yeah, man, tempers run in my family. Everybody says, oh, we got some bad tempers in my... You ever hear people say that? You know, I'm just guessing maybe that's a human thing. 
Maybe not just limited to your family, right? But there are certain things that are characteristic of our families, and we identify with them, we associate with them because of our name. You know what you are? You are a Christian. Man, you're a child of God in Christ. And you know what you're reminded of every time you come together with God's people? You're reminded of that fact. I had somebody send me a, an email recently and said, uh, Pastor Adrian, would you pray for me? I feel really backslid and I'm really having a hard time. I said, sure, sure. And I tried to give him some scripture to help him out. And You know, one of the, the last things I closed with was this. I said, regardless of anything I can tell you from the, the Word of God, even something that might bring some comfort right now, ultimately the problem is this. The problem is if you are not associating with God's people on a regular basis and you're not in fellowship in a Bible-believing church, you're going to have a hard go of it, man. And it's not because of you. It's because of who we are as people. You need to be reminded of who you are in Jesus Christ, and that's what this is. All that you have and all that you are, (laughs) your identity, everything is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Let me say this. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter... Actually, go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? He was meek. It didn't say he was weak. It said he was meek. That's a, that's a matter of con- controlled and constrained strength. It's not a lack of strength. You know what it was? You know what else you see in Jesus Christ? You see humility. Let me, let me tell you right now. You know this as well. Sometimes when you're driving in, in, in here in the blessed city of Denver and Aurora, and the lights change as they often do, and, and people cut you off as they often do, and, and you'll notice this is the, my personal favorite is the person that you're in the left lane on I-25 and you're going as fast as you can. You've got a, a safe distance between you and this person. There's a semi-truck. I guess this has happened today. Sorry, it's fresh in my mind. Semi-truck on the right side, and this guy zooms on the right side. And then he waits until you're right about even with the semi-truck, and bam, he gets right in there. Is your first thought, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, right? Probably not. You're not thinking, oh, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. You're not thinking that. You're thinking, you jerk, why'd you do that, right? right. Now, someone cuts you off in traffic, you're ready to go to fist the with them. Jesus Christ was smitten and smacked in the face and his beard ripped out for something that wasn't his fault. And he took it. You know you find in Jesus Christ? You know you find in the body of Christ? You want to find some humility? Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. You know what you're not going to, by the grace of God, not that we're something great, but you know what you're not going to find at New Heights Baptist Church? You're not going to find elders and deacons who are put in position simply because they've got money or they've got education. It's not how it ought to work in the body of Christ. All right? I'm all for doing things in structure and in order, uh, but you don't get in positions because of money, wealth, education, or anything like that. That's not how you go and influence in this church. You went influenced by getting down on your knees and praying before God and having some humility. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ says? If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. And you, you find here with the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ and His character and what Paul reminds us of, we ought not to think more highly of ourselves, but look at this, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For it's, we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, So we being many are one body in Christ. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And every one members one of another. He goes on to talk about different ministries and different gifts and things like that. Uh, But I want to call your attention to this simple fact. If you read this passage and you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know what you walk away with? You walk away with the sense and the idea that I need you and you need me. And that's humbling. You know what none of us want to say? I don't need anybody. I can do it myself. That's not how God laid it out. God didn't lay it out for you to do it on your own. There are some things he'll call you to do on your own. I understand that. Your personal fellowship is alone with him, and I get that. 
But man, as it relates to ministering to this entire world, you aren't called to do it by yourself. That's what this is for. You know, a lot of Christians have this idea, well, I know the Bible, I don't need to go to church. You're a fool. If that's a position you take, you'd be a fool. You know why? Because it's not just about you. It's not just about me. It's about those that need what we have. And it's about doing it God's way. Whether I can rationalize it to you or not, God said it, it's right. You read this passage and you find that there's different gifts according to the grace that's given to us. But look at verse number 10. Be kindly affectionate one another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. You know what that takes? Humility. You know what it takes to say, you first. I don't mean just simply, okay, let's open a door and here, ladies first, you know, that's good and stuff. Manners are good. Some of you probably could have learned some of that and growing up, and, you know, probably would have been good for you. But when it comes to chivalry, all that's good. But I'm talking about real humility. Let me give an example. There's an opportunity to help somebody, and it means you change your schedule. You know, for the average American, I can tell you this right now, some of you have less problem throwing money in a plate and a lot more problem sacrificing your schedule. Don't you? For some of you, it's your God, and you won't change it or bend it for Him. You know what God says sometimes? I want you to sacrifice that. You say, why? That would require some humility. That would require, again, we live in a generation where kids, from the time that they're born, to the, you know, through, through uh, I mean, guys, let's, Let's be honest. You watch Pee Wee football. You know what those kids do now? They, when they cross the line, they're spiking that thing, and they're dancing, and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And they, they, you know why? Because it's all about me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Right? Hey, you were given a job, and you did it. Right. I can't imagine going, you know, I cannot imagine, you know, helping somebody and training somebody in my job. And they, they pass this certain test. And I start walking, dancing through the office. Woo! Look at me! I did it! What did I do? My job that I got paid for. We live in a generation where it's all about, look at me. And it's all about me. And you know what? You know what the body of Christ reminds you of? Reminds you of the fact that there ought to be some humility in us. The fact that Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. The fact that if you're saved tonight, somebody, whether it was your mom or dad or a Sunday school teacher or whatever, or someone knocked on your door or whatever the case might be, somebody told you about the greatest news you ever heard in your life. You know what that took that person? It took that person some time. We support a missionary to South Africa named Mike Flick. And uh, boy, he's doing a tremendous job. Um, led hundreds of people there to the Lord, and they've got a great work there in South Africa. Brother Wayne's going to get a chance to visit with them. Um, the guy that led Brother Flick, Brother Flick was a good religious man, but a lost man. Um, if I remember his, his testimony correctly, uh, raised very strictly uh, Catholic in, in Texas. And I'm not saying if you're Catholic, you're lost. You could be a saved Catholic, just like you can be a lost Baptist, okay? But he was a lost Catholic, okay? And... <laughs> Somebody came to his house, his trailer to be more specific, and told him about Jesus Christ. Now, as anything, when it comes to a, a, a beautiful quilt being made on the, or a, a beautiful fabric of some kind being sewn, you know this. If you take this shirt and you flip it inside out, you see all the nasty sides of the stitches, right? What you see right now is the stuff that's finished and it looks right and the seams are cut right and everything's right. On the inside, that's where all the messy stuff's at. On the outside, what you can see is that this man named Freddie Reed led Mike Flick to the Lord, and what a glorious thing it was. And now look at all the people that have been saved because that guy took some of his time. Here's the backside to that story. Brother Reed, had, his wife had left him. He was by himself, and he was about to quit the ministry. He said, you know what? I'll go out one more time. And he led Brother Flick to the Lord. What am I getting at? Took some humility to put his problems aside and say, let me serve someone else, even if it is just one more time. <laughs> Lastly, Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Mamas, I know these kids turn into pumpkins after 8 o'clock, so I'm going to do my best. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. 
Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. You know what you find in the body of Christ? You find charity. He talks about let love be without dissimulation here in Romans chapter 12. That means not showing partiality to people. If we're honest tonight, there are certain people, maybe even in this room, who you just automatically get along with better. You understand them better. They, they have kids that are your age, whatever the case might be. There are things that you look at and you go, yep, we have commonalities and, and we just click and that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But understand this. Understand that your love as a Christian should not be limited to the people that you like. Right. Or the people that click with you. Or the people that you found a Facebook, a Facebook a group you know, chat thing with or whatever the case might be. It shouldn't be limited to that. Your love should be without dissimulation. You should be just as excited to see the guy who just got saved last week as the guy that's been here for four years and you really don't understand why he's here. <laughs> if there is such a guy. Hopefully that guy for you is not me, okay? <laughs> All right? But if there was, you know what? You ought, to be you ought to love and have charity towards each other. This ought to be a safe place. You know what? You ought to be able to find the body of Christ a safe haven from that out there. Can I tell you what the world is like? Young ladies, listen to me. I know I'm just pointing at my daughters, but there's other young ladies in here. The world will look at you for how beautiful you are until you're not beautiful anymore. And I got news for you, ladies. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are right now. And you, look, you may be, you know, beautiful and, and, and your husband will tell you you are and all that. But eventually the wrinkles are coming. Eventually the white hair. I, I found one, man. There's a big one right here. There's a big white hair. The white hairs are coming. The wrinkles are coming. All right? The fact that you could work out and watch what you eat and this still are right here it won't go away. It's coming. If it isn't there already, what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is this. This world, I mean, look at the magazines. If I were to talk to you about, let me, let's do this. All right, young people. Who's Cindy Lauper? <laughs> Some of you from the 80s. <laughs> Just want to read it. Right? All right, you're already thinking in your head all these different sounds. All right? All right, I could go through a list. Of, you know what? They were the gods and goddesses of the decades prior. Now there's new ones. And I could tell you about songs that I heard in the 90s when I was in high school. And you know what? Some of you can laugh about those. But, man, they were cool back then. And there was gods and goddesses. But you know what? Eventually, the world looks at what you have, and eventually they get tired of you, and they chew you up, and they spit you out. Even the career is that way. The workplace is that way. When you're smart, and you're young, and you're talented, boy, they want you. But eventually, you get old and slow. And there's someone that's younger and smarter and faster than you. And you'll be done. And they'll get them in your place. It's not like that in the body of Christ, man. I've met saints that are 80 and 90 years old. And boy, they are just as sweet, sometimes sweeter. And they are such a blessing. There's a, a, a light that shines from their, their, their testimony. There's a light that shines from their smile. There's something about them because they've been walking with the Lord for that many years. You can't find that out there. You say, why? Charity. Charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't say this to throw stones. Understand that if somebody is Islamic, I pray for them to be saved, just like I would for someone who's not Islamic and someone who professes to be a Christian and they're lost. All right? I don't hate somebody because they're a different religion. But it would be foolish to ignore the differences. You know what the symbol of Christianity is? The symbol of Christianity is a man laying his life down for everybody. You know what the symbol of Islam is? It's a sword. You can't say they're compatible. They're not. You can't say they're all equal. They're not. You'd be, you'd be mad to say that. What am I getting at? You've got a religion whose founder says, love your enemies. What is that? Charity. That's charity. Hey, that takes a man to take a beating like that and still say, today you'll be with me in paradise. You ever think about that? That same thief who the Lord says that to, at the beginning of the experience on the cross, 
he is also derailing the Lord. He's also, you know, calling him out. He's with the other guy. And the Lord still at the end says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Say, what is that charity? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I, I just want to end with this. After he gets done talking about different gifts in the body, some of which are sign gifts that are uh, given to the apostles specifically in the early church and are done away with at this point in time, some of which are not necessarily sign gifts. Some of them are gifts of administration, gifts of governments, things like that, gifts of helps. He gets done talking about all those different gifts, and look at verse 31. But covet earnest, earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Now, you don't understand what that more excellent way is unless you read chapter 13. You know what that is? Charity. Charity. You find some things in the body of Christ that you won't find anywhere else. And while I can show you doctrinally that this body is a mystery and that this body is not just confined to one local church, I do want to remind you that Paul wrote this to a group of Christians that were assembling in a local church. And it's a good reminder. When you're tempted to think, why am I here? What does it matter? I'm not the head. I'm not the mouth. I can't speak. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm just a little pinky toe. You ever try to walk without your pinky toe? I, I'm no one important. I'm just a knee bone. She's not getting around real well. Why? Hers is all banged up. You know what happens when one of the members is not being the part of the body that they ought to be? The body doesn't function right. You might think, well, you know what I am? I'm just the backside of the elbow. I'm nothing. You're a member that God has placed here because it pleased Him. That's what you find in the body of Christ. So I ask you tonight, what do you find here? Let's all stand.